Buon pomeriggio e benvenuti a... Good afternoon and welcome to the meeting on the forming of society in Mesopotamia and in the Bible, person and state, to yesterday and today. This is a very interesting cultural subject. The best thing about the meeting is that it opens up new horizons and it's very important to keep the horizons solid and sound if they're good ones. But it's a very good idea to open new horizons and Giorgio Bucellati, our guest, does just that. We've been used to thinking about the pre-Grecian civilizations as dead civilizations, very interesting history and stories, but they don't really, we think, have any import on our life. The uh, research of Bucellati, indeed the family Bucellati that have worked on this subject for years, this research has achieved enormous results and opened up new horizons. Archaeology has become something which is not only fascinating but also of interest for us today. And things that uh, happened in Mesopotamia in fact touch upon us, touch us today. Now we're going to look today at uh, what was that something that brought together areas of knowledge which usually don't impinge on one another. They respect one another, but they don't really interweave. And this opens up new ideas, and it's a challenge, as I was saying to my guest just a while back, because the world of research and uh, uh, academia is not particularly revolutionary. So when a discovery overturns the spheres of knowledge, well, usually there people put up shields. And when it was discovered that archaeology and the doctrine of the state and the biblical is Jesus, uh, all tend to interweave together. Well, this discovery, in fact, tended to be shunted on one side because it meant that too many books had to be rewritten. And these books that Giorgio Bucciolati has written now will force people, honest people, to rewrite many books and because it does overturn things. And this is what we are going to listen to today. Two volumes of a very interesting series of research have been already published. I hope to have a copy of this to show you. Indeed, this last table is about these books. The first of and the last of a series of four have been published, and it's against the backdrop of uh, these publications, as I say, that we're talking today. We have as participants on my left and right, Giorgio Bucciolati, who is Professor Emeritus of History and Archaeology of the Ancient Near East at the UCLA in Los Angeles, and Ignacio Carballosa Perez, who is a teacher of the Old Testament at the Theology Faculty at the University of San Damaso, uh, Madrid, and Andrea Simoncini, who teaches constitutional law. Now, we are going to have three chapters, and each of these three chapters will be dealt with by our speakers. So I have to ask you to applaud at the beginning and at the end, but not in the middle, because in fact, we're, you'll break up the sequence. So you can applaud now and then at the end. Now let's start with the first chapter, Community and a Society, and I'd like to give the floor to Professor Giorgio Bucciolati. Well, can we have the title, please, ask the professor? Now, these are the three chapters, as Robbie said, a Community and Society, the Cost of Solidarity, the Impact on the Person or on Society, and the model of socialization. So let's start looking at the Mesopotamia question. 
and I'd like to invite you to come with me in a mental exercise. Imagine that you are participating in this session of the meeting as men and women of the caves, of cave men and women. Almost as if it were possible to just leap 12, 15,000 years of history and prehistory and uh, become virgins of civilization. What would, you, what would surprise you most? You might think technology, architecture, electricity, clothes, but you could get quite used to these things quickly. There's something much more fundamental that would really weigh upon you almost without remedy and adaption to which you would not be able to recognize a society. You would need some sort of decompression chamber to get used to it. And what is this fact? The fact that we today here in this room quite, quite happily bear the presence of each other without ever having had, for the most part, the possibility of getting to know each other well. And you can see that, in fact, for three million years, indeed, I underline three million years, hominids and men lived in very small groups, uh, smaller numbers than we have in this room today. They lived in very, very small groups where the social glue was mutual face-to-face -face recognition and knowledge of each other. So how is it possible to overcome this uh, limitation which had uh, kept human groups within the confines of such a small number of people for such a long time. How was it that after millions of years, suddenly, in the space of a couple of thousands of years, the situation changed, for the most part, everywhere in the world? The answer has two parts. First of all, we have the introduction of articulated language. The assumption is that this radical change and the development of articulated language took place about 50,000 years ago. Not that hominids and men didn't emit uh, differentiated sounds before, but articulated complex language from a phonic and syntactic point of view is something completely different to just emitting sounds. And it's only in this way that perceptions, you can also say thoughts, take on an extrasomatic statute, as it were, in status. Linguistic achievement, the achievement of a language, meant that language was independent of how it existed in the mind. And this was something, therefore, that could be communicated and shared, something that had never been possible before. The second answer to our simple question of uh, how is it that a human group was able to change so very rapidly and radically was the development of an ability that I would call meta-perceptive. In other words, the ability to put two or more perceptions into relationship, but which are at the same time not adjacent in time and space. The example I give is the relationship between seed and plant. To be able to see the consequentiality of these two things means that you take disparate elements and you drag them uh, together after long spans of time. And uh, this, in fact, goes to a whole series of other things. For example, the nature of the soil and the ability to farm it. You can see how these two faculties uh, bringing together distinct elements and to uh, develop linguistic embodiment, as it were, articulated language, that these two things were able to exponentially increase man's control over the world, the natural world, and this led to the emergence of society as a meta-perceptive community. So in this way, we see a new ability to frame and understand reality into pigeonholes, autonomous pigeonholes. The 
practically immeasurable advantage was that these pigeonholes could be easily manipulated and controlled and you could foresee their functioning in a mechanically accurate way so in the same way you could put into pigeonholes human beings as well as nature seeds and plants and so on it was no longer therefore important or necessary to know each other personally. If you needed a pottery vase, you could go to a potter, even if you didn't know him. The pigeonhole potter was more important than the content of the pigeonhole, you know, i.e. a po potter that you know personally. And therefore, uh, you can situate the setting up of a society proper in this way. Before, there was just a community where relationships were strictly personal. Now today, society made it possible for individuals to relate among themselves in a more functional rather than personal way. The degree of efficiency therefore became incomparably greater. The availability of functions had no comparison with the availability of people and therefore human beings learned to relate to one another in a completely new way. And this is when we see come into or come onto the scene the use of power, in other words politics. Only those who are able to control the ramifications of society at all levels and uh, who can give a sense of governance or direction which is indispensable for the coherence of the group and this coincides with the formation of the state as an entity in which power is administrated in a systematic sovereign manner i.e. excluding external interference therefore now you can understand that a experimental game I wanted to play with you at the beginning because we here today are perfectly at ease uh, among ourselves even if there really isn't an, oh, an us I mean we're all individuals and we don't know each other practically but we share a huge number of functional relations that, that bind us one to the other. Here at the table, a top table, our function is to present a subject. There in your seats, your function is to follow the arguments, even if you really don't have any idea who we all are. Our social synergy is very real, even if it's very limited in time and space. Uh, it will in fact j just dissolve in a few minutes the minute we leave this room but it's a very efficient synergy in these very few minutes even if we don't know each other we have shared a sense of shared we hope shared finality which hopefully will give more long-lasting uh, fruits and products than uh, the duration of the few moments that we're going to pass together now Let's look into the uh, Meso Mes into Mesopotamia and let's look at a small people called Israel. And we want to surprise Israel in its self-awareness, in what it says, in other words, of itself. How uh, this people conceives of its origins, what are the constitutional elements that make up its personality. In other w words, what accounts does Israel refer to when it has to explain itself? And the answer to these questions you find in the Bible, which is the real content and receptacle of the self-awareness of the chosen people, which has been forged by its history. So our task will be to identify in these books the perception that Israel has of the categories that today we are looking at, person, society, state. At the beginning of the biblical people, we said last year, there wasn't an original mythical time signed by a relationship of a nation state X with the god Y of the pantheon Z, for example, which we could well imagine or think would be so because we're in Mesopotamia, 
Mesopotamia. Israel goes back to an event in space and time, the call of Abraham, the polytheist of Ur of the Chaldeans in the first half of the second millennium before Christ. So at the beginning of Israel, we have a person that enters into a relationship with the mystery. And we could say that the original origin of uh, this people is the constituting of an I, not in the sense of a new creation, but Israel has always conceived of itself as part of uh, the same unique creation of the whole human race, but in the sense rather of a new self-awareness born from dialoguing with God, a self-awareness which is signed by belonging to a God of the call and the promise which starts a hit story and which uh, calls the people of Israel to a responsibility. God will from then onwards always be the God of Abraham, Isaac and Jacob. In other words, the God that has revealed himself in a particular relationship in a particular historic time. But in the setting up of this I, the call of Abraham, we see the constitution of that relationship as being the promise of a new society, the promise of a people that will be born of faith. Now the Lord said unto Abraham, Get thee out of thy country, and from thy kindred, and from thy father's home, and unto a land that I will show thee, and I shall make of thee a great nation, and I will bless thee, and make thy name great, and thou shalt be a blessing. So a family story starts here signaled by the dialectic between the impossibility of uh, the uh, circumstances, sterility, danger, hunger, and the always possible which characterizes uh, the interventions of God in history. So a people is born which in its self-awareness will always say we are the sons and children of uh, Abraham. And in fact, in the perception that Israel will develop uh, with regard to the origin of humanity and its accounts of creation, it's the person that is created in the image and likeness of God. It's not a city, not a state. And in Egypt, we meet the people already constituted and which has grown so much as to be a threat to the dominant power. We have a, a people which is made up of family tribes, but together and united by a common ancestor. And it's in Egypt that God will in fact uh, show its presence and uh, free this people from slavery. From then on, all the memory of this people is underlined and colored by this event. It is the foundation of uh, the alliance. It's uh, the content of liturgical celebrations, which is passed on from generation to a generation. With the period in the desert, with the alliance on Sinai, and the laws which follow from it, represent the constitutive period of the, this people. And in the law, and in the Pentateuch, this uh, is the period where we see uh, the founding elements of uh, this people. Let's have a look at these elements. First of all, it's a law in uh, opposition to uh, the Mesopotamic laws, which are, it's a law which is set within the framework of a narrative, i.e. the story of the relationship between God and his people. In fact, uh, very often the commandments find their justification in the history of the benefits that Israel has received from God. The law is not promulgated by a king. It's not linked to the authority of a law. It's the law of God. Moses, called the legislator, is only a mediator. He's not a king. He doesn't have palaces, nor does he have a scepter, armor, army, throne, territory. He does not found any d dynasty. He's a prophet, and he too comes under the law, indeed, because in fact uh, he was uh, vacillated before the law, he will not enter the promised land. Indeed, this is, however, not a law which is promulgated in connection to any territory. It's cons 
delivered in the desert and is not a law which applies within a state frontier. It's a personal, not territorial set of laws, in fact, and it governs the relationship between God and the people. And the law for a people, for an ethnic group, the law refers to an ethnic group with whom God has established an alliance. It's not a code of laws promulgated by a king for a particular territory. The individual who belongs to the history of a people remains the center of legislation. And when uh, the people entered uh, the uh, promised land, it's uh, made up of uh, various tribes which are in fact linked to the uh, ancestor and they are joined together to be part of the alliance with God. And God is not the guarantor who it would be uh, not the guarantor of the law between the state and the king. God is a contractual party to this alliance. The part of the people, therefore, there has to be a consensus. And this has to be real and not sham. And you can see this from the consequences and uh, uh, the consequences. And the people are responsible before God and not before man of any violation of the law. So from this, we see the role of the prophets, which uh, bring uh, the people before the tribunal of God and not before a human tribunal. Certainly, there are judges and human uh, trials because uh, there has to be regulation of the laws but uh, it will always be crimes against the uh, divine uh, alliance even if they are committed and uh, against a fellow person and therefore what we have heard are two stories which represent as many possible alternatives in the definition of our human adventure. The two things that we have heard are two possibilities which recall to us that at the beginning of any civilization there is an alternative there, that between function or the person. At the beginning either there is the freedom of the eye or there is a pigeonhole to mention uh, or to use a Gelati's words, and the function that we each have in a particular society. These are dense with meaning. Man discovers the ability to be able to pigeonhole reality into abstract categories. In other words, taken from reality, but independent of it. And the language that has been developed introduces this possibility, but this uh, does not just apply to people, things, and instruments. It applies to other people as well, other men, not just to things. And therefore, one can pigeonhole other men for the function that that person has in the society. And therefore, to when we meet with a pot potter, we see the abstract concept of potter rather than the person. And the pigeonhole potter, as Giorgio Buccellati says, becomes more important than the actual person. And so on, for uh, down a slope, so that uh, society is increasingly depersonalized. So we have man seen as a function. And that is the basis for what the state will be as we see it today. And yet, it's in that, in that same history of Mesopotamia, we have understood and learned how there's another story, that of the uh, Jewish people. Uh, what can uh, com uh, combat the inevitable use of functions rather than people? Only the I can oppose this. And, but how does the I, the person, come about. And this is what the history of Israel tell, tells us. Uh, like uh, Abraham, in fact, uh, has said and done, 
the I can exist and the freedom can exist only if, like Abraham, there is a relationship with God and the people can be born. It's the law of the people, not of the state, as we have heard. And in history, the Israeli people, the Jews, live a, a history of their people, which in fact is the law of God. But this debate that we have seen, this alternative that we have seen, is it something which belongs to prehistory and is studied only by the experts? Is man free or is he still working in the sense of only as a function? Can he, in fact, be a person or is he confined within the restricted space of a pigeonhole? Now, to answer this question, I found very pertinent what Vaclav Havel wrote in 1978 in an essay entitled The Power of Those Without Power. Havel doesn't talk about totalitarian systems or only about totalitarian systems, but uh, he talks about post-totalitarian systems, systems that are still alive and uh, we continue to keep them alive because we're responsible for their functioning. The difference that Havel sees is that why the old totalitarian systems rely and are based on explicit violence, post-totalitarian systems rely on and are based on a more subtle, invisible violence, ideology. And what is ideology? I cite Havel. The function of ide ideology is to provide an alibi and provide man with an alibi because he's a, a victim of this system but give him the illusion that he's in sin in harmony with the human order and the human uh, the order of the universe and accept being a f function and that is why ideology is so important says Havel in post totalitarian systems and the complicated uh, putting together of factors, of degrees, and uh, the instruments of ma manipulation would be unthinkable without this universal alibi. Opere historiche. Alibi. But it is very important to today's uh, society. This reduction of man to a function is still the social glue we use today. The ideology that defines our pigeonhole today might well be very different. It might be a success, it might be health, might be a career, uh, uh, conquering us or gaining pow political power. But again, it's always uh, his power or its power that defines men. But when we see a truly free re link between God, free because it's linked only to God, uh, I'm sorry, when we see a, a free relationship between people, and it's a free relationship only because it's linked to God, that is when we see that we can get beyond the function, a mere function of men. Now, I think that this was picked up very effectively by Don Giovanni, and he said, if a man were simply the biological result of father and mother, that brief inst instant when uh, in a few seconds uh, the ephemeral result was this, well then m the word freedom would be cynically ridiculous. The expression, the right of people, and the very word person would be a uh, word without meaning, and freedom would be without any fundament. It would be flatus versus. But we have to suppose that that point is not exclusively a biological moment of something that passed between father and mother, but rather it goes beyond the biological tradition and a direct relationship with uh, the infinite, with that mysterious X, uh, which is above the flow of reality. Uh, you're well, well done not to applaud. Uh, now, if we, we've all heard about these things, but we have never, in fact, heard them talked of, linked together as we are hearing today. Now, before, 
we continue, I'd like to recall you that we're talking about a particular region in the world which is not who knows where. It's only three hours flight from here. And it, this means Syria and Iraq today, Mesopotamia. So these are countries which hit the headlines because of the dramatic situations. In fact, I see witnesses here. We see uh, Mr. Ivar Zian. Uh, he is here from places where important, dramatic, and tragic things are taking place, which are very important for us uh, today. So more than ever, they are not buried civilizations. They are emerging civilizations and very much, very real civilizations today. Let us continue. Now we have seen in society, in the full sense of the word society, we have seen society emerge after a very long, slow development, millions of years, but in the space of just a couple of thousand years, in fact, from the 10th to the 4th thousand years before Christ, we see the formation and the growth of permanent settlements at that enlarged until they became great urban conglomerates. Now, 3,000 years before BC, we find uh, several settlements where uh, 100 hectares were covered where thousands of individuals lived, which is characteristic of most towns until the Industrial Revolution. They had about 20,000 inhabitants. Now, the concept of society in this new urban society was very different from the concept of community that was used before. We're still talking about a collectivity where the group entity prevailed over the person, where we, as I said before, refers to a group of people rather than the, to the relationship between people. The Babylonian myth, in fact, of the creation mentions this, and the father, Gavahosa, mentioned this very well. The Babylonian myth of the creation, in fact, is a primary entity unto itself. And only after that do we have the creation of man. And in this framework, man is an innominate, is an impersonal element. It doesn't have in any name. He is presented as an element able to fill in the pigeonholes, the functional pigeonholes of the urban structure, but not as somebody who wants to share life with others, first and foremost with a woman, as explained in the story of the Genesis. And in this sense, therefore, we can see a very uh, subtle polemic in the Bible which helps to throw light more clearly on the Mesopotamic conception of the city as a collective, an impersonal collective of people. Now, the more formal characteristic of civilization that is uh, comes most of the four is its writing, its ability to write. And what comes to mind when you think about this extraordinary invention of writing is the ability that it has to transmit information in precise and permanent ways. And this is very true, so much so that uh, the beginning of history we see as the time when writing was invented. But in the light of what I said vis-a-vis -vis the development of language, I think we can put forward another perspective of the value of writing. While oral communication required the simultaneous presence of uh, the speaker and the listener, so there's still, uh, to a certain extent, a degree of face-to-face -face contact, uh, writing took a step further, decisive one. The extrasomatic formalization of thought now acquires a much greater embodiment because the uh, wedge form, cuneiform tables 
allows physical contact with the thought as a reality unto itself, which is thought which is detached from the thinker. And here you can see there will be two important consequences for our argument. First of all, the content is potentially depersonalized, or at least in the sense that it takes on a value which is independent of the moment of its origin. We have an increasing distance from nature as the founding dimension of reality, and we tend to become more and more reliant on what I would call the diaphragms of artificiality that are put in the place of nature. The second consequence of the invention of writing is uh, the increasing ability to control uh, that writing makes possible. Those functional pigeonholes now take on a physical autonomous characteristic. The Most of the cuneiform texts, in fact, are of an administrative nature where groups of individuals and individuals and commodities uh, literally visibly uh, in and as pigeonholes so the control of thought becomes very concrete now we still in fact are living in the wake of these enormous upheavals and in the light of what we have seen we can I believe give a more in-depth judgment of what is happening to us today if you think of the computer the digital systems that we have allow us to, as it were, extra somatize thought, not just as a static set of data, but uh, also in terms of a dynamic process. Programs manipulate and transform data independent of any human agent, even if they're still guided by them at the end of the day. The distance from nature, the ability to control, therefore becomes even wider. Now, uh, with the greater efficiency of our society and our civilization, uh, we have, uh, oh, that's the main hallmark of our society. Otherwise, we wouldn't be able to sit here in the room without knowing each other. The solidarity that links us allows us to achieve uh, levels of sharing that would be inconceivable outside the social dimension that is ours. And as a result, we, in fact, personally enrich ourselves. My effort to develop an argumentation allows me to be comforted by your attention, but also I hope that you can draw personal entertainment and pleasure from listening to me. The diaphragms of artificiality, as I have put it, are not a condemnation to death of nature. We can become enriched in our humanity and in our naturalness as a result of our social systems, but also it can be the source of destruction. And an example is one of the most disastrous side effects of civilization, slavery. This is the strain functionalization of a human being where the status of being a human is waived in favor of putting that person into a mechanical pigeonhole. And at that point, we arrive at the maximum peak of depersonalization. So uh, the important lesson there is that we must be entrapped by efficiency. The important thing is to tame our very ability to tame and nature. Now we look again at Israel. We have uh, seen the birth of uh, the city-state in Mesopotamia in contrast to the people of Israel and its birth. But you shouldn't think that Israel wasn't tempted to be like any other nation. It certainly did have this temptation. Uh, as uh, it uh, didn't, uh, wasn't satisfied with what God uh, chose uh, in turn to guide the people, uh, the heads of the tri tribes wanted a king 
like all other nations have, they said. So they go to the prophet Samuel and they ask for a king. Samuel was uh, displeased with this, but the Lord said, listen to the voice of the people in everything they say, because uh, they have not rejected you, but me, so that uh, until I reign over you, but take care to warn them solemnly and to tell them clearly what the actions of the king who will rule over them shall be. And then he continues that list of the disadvantages, the abuse of power, which is a use of irony on the part of God. He, the king, shall take your sons and will put them on the carts and he will take his knights and he will make them run before the carriages and he will make you plow the land and harvest the fields. He will take your daughters to uh, make into them uh, cooks and uh, bakers. He will take your fields and your vineyards and your best olive groves to give them to your s servants. He will take one-tenth of your flock and then you will cry out because of your king and what he has done to you but the Lord and you cry out to the Lord but the Lord shall not uh, reply but in fact they wanted this uh, experiment of an experience of monarchy and it lasted 300 years now we can see first of all that the setting up of a monarchical society is not part of the nature of Israel as part of its constituent set of norms of the law. It was a concession by which the people of Israel wanted to become like other nations. God seconds the freedom of the people so that in a second time uh, they can turn to a, a different system and uh, be sure of the promise of the Messiah. The true king of Israel is the Lord. Uh, there is no legal system or role of government that can replace it. And then also in the warning of Samuel to the heads of the tribes, in fact, is a tendency and shows the tendency of the state to constitute itself as an abstract entity and sacrifice the best of its resources. And there we see also the warning against a concentration of power. And then slavery and oppression are born as a consequence of that concentration of power. Not everyone is equal before the law. It's quite surprising, really, the judgment that Israel left in the pages of the Bible of its kings, the literature of the nation that uh, surrounds it is made of ad maiorum gloriam of the kings that governed it. In the Bible, the expression is that this king did what is evil in the eyes of the Lord, and he did worse than all his predecessors. And in fact, King David and Solomon are remembered for their sins, and their sins are set down. Now, during the period of uh, the monarchy in Israel and before the excesses of the king, God develops the person of the prophet who is not linked to any institution. Indeed, the birth of the prophet is, in fact, the waning of the institution of the monarchy. And the prophet is called freely to... Uh, put himself forward. The prophet comes about as the person against the abuse of power. The prophet is the living memory of the alliance that God has established with his people and uh, makes and develops a direct uh, relationship with uh, the individual. If in some way you afflict them, weakest, the widow and the orphan, and they cry to me, 
I shall hear their cry and my anger shall be enormous. In fact, in the Bible we see really audacious and a very daring uh, criticism of uh, the monarch uh, and uh, places uh, the monarch before his responsibilities and before uh, the real judge God. For example, Nathan, uh, the prophet Nathan, in fact, uh, criticizes uh, King David for his great uh, sin for abusing his power and taking the wife of Uriah and killing him. There's another less well-known episode which is just and even more representative of the affairs of state. It's the history of, or the story, I beg your pardon, of the vineyard of Nabot that was near the palace of Akab, the king of Israel, the northern kingdom. The king needed more space for a, an orchard and therefore he offered Nabot a vineyard elsewhere or the money Nabot refused and uh, I shall not uh, give you the inheritance of my fathers, he says. Akab goes home anger, angered and irritated and Jezebel, his wife, however said, are you or not the sovereign of Israel? Get up, eat, uh, and uh, be of good heart. Uh, the vineyard of Nabot of Israel, I shall uh, let you have it. Uh, he uh, convenes a tribunal against uh, Nabot, uh, and he pays uh, two false uh, uh, witnesses, and uh, he is put to death, and the king takes possession of the vineyard. And the prophet uh, Elijah, Elijah, in fact, uh, criticized openly uh, the king and Jezebel. To find other episodes of abuse of power, we don't have to go very far. In our modern states, in our modern day, there are expropriations and embargoes that uh, are developed by modern states and using the raison d'etat, but which are little other than the abuse of power that we have talked of before. There are two episodes at which we can draw in the conclusion of this. The law is the true God, the king of Israel, and uh, the king is uh, only a servant of the true God and the king has to be subject to God and his law and the king must ensure that he does not raise his spirit above his brothers he is not above his brothers but equal before his brethren before the law and then also the prophet who never casts into question the institution of the monarchy nonetheless plays a role of trying to balance and uh, cry out against the abuses of the king. The prophets, in fact, represent a very important factor in the history of uh, God that underlined to us that free men determined by the relationship with God are the continual memory of uh, this uh, factor. Now, Israel, in fact, could have slaves, but had to take them from the surrounding nations. Within the chosen people, there was just one principle, and that was, I, Lord, who've taken me out of the kingdom of Egypt, shall not be a slave. None of your brothers shall be a slave. And the Jubilee guaranteed this principle. And if one of yours becomes poor and sells himself to you, he shall not be your slave. He shall be like your guest. So here we have an example of uh, the link uh, 
of the alliance. Now we come back to today, we have again heard a chorus with two voices, as it were. We have seen that more than 5,000 years ago, we saw the birth of the Mesopotamic civilization and the idea of the state. And as in the Babylonian mythology, the city becomes before man, but then we've seen on the other side the song of Israel born because of the call of one man. But as we have heard from Naho Kajakosa, the people of Israel also wanted and was tempted by the totalitarian re regimen of uh, a regime of the king. But the po even if they accepted monarchy, the prophet always stood out against uh, abuse of power and the uh, king. They were the representatives of the presence of the mysterious uh, God, the true uh, sovereign. But what is pertinent today? I mean, does the Mesopotamic model uh, hold sway or the children of Israel's model? What comes first, in other words, the state or the person? Well, after more than 5,000 years, the question is still an open one. And the state, the source of laws and justice, is that what comes first? Or, in fact, uh, are laws and justice, the equity and the fairness which comes from the state, is uh, this to be held and to be seen ahead and being more important than the individual. So we have to ask ourselves today, how come this question is still open today? What comes first, the person of the state or the state of the person? Why are we still talking about this issue? The open wounds that we still have uh, with regard to this theme are very, very recent and they don't go back to biblical times or 3,000 uh, years ago. We're talking about the last uh, century only. We're talking about our grandfathers and fathers who came up against this issue. Our formula is this. Everything in the state, nothing outside the state, and nothing against the state. This sentence is not part of the Amurapi Code but it was pronounced by Benito Mussolini in October 1925, 90 years ago. And it could well be pronounced again. As Havel taught us, fascism, like all totalitarian regimes, before it became an anti-democratic and non-liberal power, was an ideology. In a state ideology, man no longer asks himself the question of what can I do, what's my responsibility, how can I contribute to resolving this problem. But the first question he puts rather is, where's the state, where's the government, what door must I knock at? And uh, today, not in the 20 years of the fascist regime in Italy, we still have now the rebirth of the idea that to be public, everything has to be of the state. Yet again, everything in the state, nothing outside the state, and especially nothing against the state. You could say that this is uh, something of time past, but certainly the idea that the what is public must be of the state is still an idea that is very much with us. In fact, not that far, a long time away and ago, I remember that uh, there was a referendum in Bologna and the citizens were asked whether it was a good idea to continue to finance nursery schools that in fact were not state schools or whether just uh, state schools should be financed. In the ideology of the promoter of the referendum was the idea that uh, everything had to belong to the state and that could be nothing outside the state. It's a very conception of the res publica. And as the mayor of Bologna was elected by uh, the left and opposed this referendum, he said uh, the municipality must promote and uh, 
sustain what citizens do in the interests of the, the community and being against the idea that there can be other things other than a public schooling is something which would be the ruin of our country. And therefore, the alternative to the Mesopotamic model of the city-state in, uh, in the biblical tradition is something which is still very pertinent. Now, the third point that I'd like to touch is how have we tried to solve this problem? the tragedies of totalitarianism of the 20th century, fascism, Nazism, and the Soviet regime, our answer has been to put certain values above uh, the laws and uh, outside uh, temporal power. And uh, that's we, in fact, why we see the Italian constitution set down as it is, which is an example. Article 2 of the Italian constitution says, the Republic recognizes and guarantees unassailable rights to man as an individual, both in the social forms, where his own personality and the fulfillment of his duties exist within a framework of political, economic, and social solidarity. Now, this constitution is saying that the person exists before the state, and the common house, as Giorgio Lopira called the constitution, the person has holds sway. Every uh, human person is an individual and must feel the need for the other, which in Christian language is called charity, and which in the constitutional language of the Constitution is translated as solidarity. Allow me to add that Article 2 of the region of Lombardy of 2008 is even clearer. Uh, it says that the human person is at the origin of all institutions. I don't think there's any founding charter that uh, has says this. It's only the Lombardy Constitution, but it does say this. Uh, and uh, Lombardy is larger than 10 of the 27 e European Euro Union countries, by the way. Let's come to Mesopotamia, which is larger than Lombardy. Mesopotamia is uh, as large as Italy. Now, in the journey we have taken, the actual physical territory is of inf fundamental importance. Uh, remember the concept of meta-perception. Now, the relationship here with the actual territory, with the land, is of this type. We perceive ourselves as members of the same group, but not because we recognize each other personally, but because we live in the same place. And this place, therefore, becomes what we call territory, when it takes on its own physiognomy, with which we all identify. Our term of motherland or fatherland defines uh, this relationship with a geographical envelope, as it were, through which, meta-perceptively, we recognize the other individuals of our group. In our particular case, this room is, for a few moments, our territory, our meta-perceptive envelope. And here we come to a very important consequence. There are no effective limits to this envelope. Beyond this room, we have the meeting, and then beyond that, we have Rimini, and so on and so forth. And also, over and above the first cities, we see consolidated larger and different and ever greater territorial unities, groups of cities, geographical areas, macro regions, right up to the extreme limits of territoriality, the empire. The Mesopotamic history presents as a very coherent institutional par parable in which the Assyrian Empire is the outcome. It's not just a very extended land, the image that we have an empire, you know, being very large uh, geographically, 
rather we have a new structural conception of the, the territory which is totally functionalized just as previously persons had been functionalized at the dawn of urban civilization. Now there are two mechanisms which are necessary to bring about uh, this uh, Syrian imperial model. The first is deportations of people which uh, breaks the bonds of freedom to one's country of origin but is almost seen as a reward not as a punishment however deportation. The second was uh, to have administrative restructuring whereby the empire is segmented into provinces into arbitrary entities which have nothing to do or have little to do with the original confirmation and the configuration of uh, territories. Now the emergence of uh, civilizations of uh, Syro Mesopotamia, uh, the Syrian Mesopotamian territory, have shown us a paradigm which is all the more significant because it's uh, if the first one and in fact it uh, remained uh, the example from uh, Rome onwards. In Mesopotamia in fact we uh, find ourselves at the very origins of politics in its broadest sense. Politics in the sense of the use of power and consolidating power to organize and consolidate society. The concept of sovereignty is central it reflects a maximum unchallenged authority within an area which increasingly wants to exclude other neighboring territories. So the logic of the empire is developed in an irreversible way, and i.e. to extend its sovereignty throughout the civilized world and to grow always, and therefore the empire, in fact, uh, proposes itself, uh, both ideologically and administratively, and is that formula of globalization that we are living through today, uh, for good, uh, enrichment, but also for bad, for the uh, flattening out and uh, of civilizations and people. Now, we have seen in a very brief period this take place. For three millions of years, communities developed very, very slowly, and it took only 2,000 years, however, to go from the language and uh, the development of urban civilization to uh, the Assyrian Empire, which was uh, set itself out to be the centralized state. Now, the human person, a state of emergency is the title of our meeting. Now, this title can be interpreted in two etymological meanings of the word emergency. We can talk about the emergence of man in the fullest sense the emergence of a person linked to another person and bound by bonds that uh, go beyond the face-to-face -face rapport. And also, this is the emergence of man in the fullest sense of the word, the emergence of a civilized person, a human, which is uh, all the richer, the more he, in fact, takes on uh, the other and takes on the impersonal space. But where emerging becomes an emergency is uh, when uh, this becomes repression. Uh, and when we go to the extreme functionalization of people with slavery or the extreme functionalization of territory with the empire, we see uh, that from this emerging, we get to an emergency. Now, if this is the title of a meeting and it's an event, we should also recall 
the word meeting as an institution. Meeting for the friendship of peoples. For the last 34 years, it's been like that. And here, the accent is on the question of relations between people. Meeting, of course, means to come together. It means recognizing people rather than pigeonholes, anonymous pigeonholes. If, uh, in fact, pigeonholes can't meet uh, and come together, they can't make friends, certainly. So the emergency arises when we lose our humanity. It's the personal meeting. It's the meeting, the friendship, which is the fundamental aspect of encounter and that redeems us from uh, being anonymous. This is uh, the uh, true promise and way that we can only reach a truly human and uh, civil society. Now, we have heard talk about the uh, Assyrian Empire, the real, the first real empire. Israel was under the yoke of this empire. Israel is smaller than Lombardy, by the way. So how is it possible to talk about the universalization of this biblical model starting from such a small territory? Now, when I have to explain to my students that the history of Israel, there's a date which, if I have to choose among all the important dates of Israel, I always put one, and I always put it in my exams, for example, 580, uh, Six, the drama of uh, 587, the temple is destroyed and uh, the king of Israel is taken to Babylon and uh, much of the population is exiled. And 450 years of monarchy, in fact, uh, ends in Jerusalem, 587. And the temple, the divine house of Solomon, the fundament of security of Israel is destroyed. And this is the key date. And the opening up, however, also, this is a date which leads to the opening up of the possibility of salvation of their land and nations. But at that time, Israel was deprived of everything, its uh, land, its uh, temple. And it has to underline and understand what it really has to do and what and where it has to turn and go back to its original moment, that of the effective relationship with the Lord of everyone and for everyone, because God chose uh, the people of Israel to be able to arrive at all nations. And in the Bible says, listen to me, you who seek the Lord, consider the rock uh, that you have cut. Consider Abraham, your father, and Sarah, uh, who gave birth, because I called him when he was alone, and I blessed him and got him to multiply. So the historic relationship that God established with Abraham seemed nothing. He was alone, but from him was born a great people. The alliance with Abraham, as an alliance with the people in the desert, was done regardless of the land, regardless of the state, i.e. the monarchy, and the temple. In the logic of the world, and uh, compared to the uh, gods of other nations, it would seem that Israel's God, in fact, has remained uh, wounded. Where is our God, uh, Israel said. And uh, by Isaiah the prophet says, but do you not know, have you not heard, have you, uh, has it not been announced to you from the beginning? Lift your eyes to on high and look who created these things. And uh, he calls them all by name. 
for the greatness of his power and for the greatness of his strength there is not one who is missing why do you Jacob say and why do you speak thus Israel my pathway is uh, hidden to the Lord have you never did you not know this have you never heard this the uh, Lord is uh, eternal God he does not tire his intelligence is inscrutable and so the God of Israel is he who created heavens and earth it is he who created all men the designs of nature are in his hands Cyrus the king of Israel who's about to free Israel from exile as Nebuchadnezzar did once and who destroyed Jerusalem only responds to a, the design of God in favor of Israel. Do not fear, Jacob, little worm or residue of Israel. I shall help you. Your Redeemer is the faint of Israel. Israel, after this pedagogical pathway, is ready to open up its alliance to all nations and said in our language, everything is ready for the universalization of the model. All one has to have still is the arrival of the great factor, Christ. Zachary, one of the last prophets, had prophesied in those days Ten men of all languages of the nations will take a Jew by his uh, robe and say, We will come with you because we have heard that God is with you. Peter, Andrew, John, the disciples of Jesus were astounded when they understood that this prophecy was actually taking place and being accomplished in them. In fact, people of all nations started to cling to their robes. The reason? Because we have heard that God is with you. The relationship that God had established once with Abraham, calling him from Abraham from your or of the Chaldeans, now is strangely close. The relationship with the man God, with the man Jesus, God uh, incarnate. And linked to him, we become uh, sons of God, of the Son, and therefore brothers. Therefore, a new people is born, broadening the frontiers of Israel, the people of the church. It is no longer an ethnic group because it brings in all the families of the peoples. But at the same time, we can say of the church that it is a very vague ethnic entity as Paul the sixth called it as the incorporation with Christ makes us he says a single family because as he said there is no Jew no Greek there is no slave no no any free person there is no male no female because you are all one in Jesus Christ and uh, these words are not just uh, thoughts you can see this from the attitude of Paul who writes to the Christian uh, Philomenus so that he be converted in prison no longer as a slave but as a brother the universalization of the model which started with the Alliance of Israel is not carried out on the basis of the Mosaic law which is the law of the Semitic peoples we in Christ are sons of the promise made to Abraham that was to become the blessing for all people. Uh, the law of Israel is uh, not what is of importance here. It is the alliance uh, with the uh, historic alliance with Israel. Christ did not create a state. He gave his presence. He entrusted um, his presence to the apostles, the church has no territory, it inhabits all nations, it uh, doesn't have a king, the Pope is not uh, the head of the state of the church, Christ is the head. The Christ in fact will be the first however to uh, succumb and 
temptation as did Israel, but it's a temptation against the very nature of the church. The presence of the Spirit of Christ ensures today as yesterday that there will be the possibility to continually renew our acknowledgement of the Son of God to become free from any power and at the same time be the generators of unity um, of all peoples in on earth. Now in this last chapter of our chorus we're going to look to the future and the future is universalization. It, future means the going beyond uh, all but boundaries, even the state boundaries, even what in the 19th century has seemed to be a definitive development, the state, this was cast into question in the 20th century. The state today seems too small. The horizon is increasingly international, global, universal. But still again, the off the contradiction between the Mesopotamic and the biblical traditions put us before a, a dilemma, an alternative. In fact, there are two ways in which the state can be gone beyond and extended to uh, reach the extreme confines of the earth. The first model is the empire, as we said. It's quite extraordinary to hear the resemblance of the characteristics of the Assyrian empires of 3,000 years ago and the totalitarian regimes that we've known in the last two centuries. We've heard about the deportations, taking a man away from his roots. And the technique of the deportation was used by the Soviet Union, but not only by the Soviet Union. The practice of uh, uprooting and uh, deportation didn't finish with the USSR. There was something that uh, survived uh, which is more profound and uh, uh, that is the idea that a, a mil that a universal dominion of rights can be developed by cutting out bonds and abolishing differences uh, not founded on l'homme situé, the concrete man, but by, as French jurists would say, but by the so-called abstract I. Everybody has the right to everything. This could be in some the code of Amu uh, Murabi. Even objects can have rights. This is the new slavery, the new Auschwitz, as uh, Claudio Cefo's uh, song says it. In other words, uh, a man, be, him, be he a son or an adult, can also uh, become the object of entertainment or pleasure of another man. And on the other hand, however, we have the dominion of uh, bureaucracy, a new universal state in which uh, nobody needed to be good. But uh, this scenario, which is becoming more and more realistic, is at least offset by the biblical version. First of all, Israel has been educated to underline that uh, it uh, didn't receive uh, this because of its power, but because it had been stripped of everything. And being stripped of everything, they understood fully what they were. And they understood that he that gives us strength is not sacred, linked to a place and a form, but rather is holy, linked, in other words, to the profound being of self. So there's another way of uh, conceiving universality to uh, recognize that we are children of uh, uh, he who has created the heaven and the earth. But as uh, Marta Hosa says, there is an apical point that has to be accepted, Christ, and uh, this is the bond with uh, God and his people. And the logic of the incarnation, in fact, uh, sidesteps, in fact, one of the main assumptions uh, on which we live today. And that is, to be universal, we have to be abstract. I think that many of the academicians uh, would agree with this. A judgment, in other words, if it, wa it, has to, if it is to be true, mustn't be linked to a concrete experience 
experience. To broaden one's horizons, we have uh, to uh, become more abstract, abstract, but in that way, men become little uh, pinpoints on a map, uh, uh, little ants, indistinguishable one from the other. But uh, with the event of the incarnation, things uh, were pointed in a different direction and uh, it underlined the dignity or absolute dignity of man. And this derives from uh, the dependence on the mystery, the experience of every man who uses region uh, openly before reality. And from this, we have the affirmation which is born from the dialogue uh, between the Hebrew Christian tradition, Greek and Roman thought, whereby reason and nature in uh, their correlations are the fundament of the adjust legal uh, system. And this principle has become the lay foundation of all um, Western legal civilizations, and it, in fact, uh, the American uh, Declaration of Independence uh, echoes this, saying, we believe in the following evident truths that are self-evident truths, and so on. But the, the intervention of the revelation in the world has created a ferment in the human horizon and have set in motion, as Nahu Kabahosa says, a ethnic reality of a general nature which does not have the aim of creating its own state or another system of power, but living in the light of this presence. Now, if uh, truth is a doctrine, there will be no true dialogue, but if uh, the truth is a person, a real person, concrete before me, well then truth becomes a relationship and a rapport, and this is a pathway that everybody can go uh, along aware of the approximation that exists with any journey that is taken. So we come back to our point of departure. Today, irresistible phenomena like globalization, universalization of models and social and legal and political systems, the only real point of resistance can be the person. As Giorgio Bucciolati has said, the title of this meeting contains a beautiful ambivalence. On the one hand, the um, man, a state of emergency, is a cry of alarm. As Betoki, the poet, said, what we need is a man. We don't need wisdom. What we need is a man in spirit and truth, not a country, not things. What we need is a man, a sure uh, footfall and a hand uh, that uh, can be grasped so that we can walk free and saved. But on the other hand, emergency of man is also that of man emerging, man emerging in his relationship with destiny. This is uh, the only real human foundation uh, for all liberties, including religious, political, and civic liberties.